See, my servant will prosper. He will be highly exalted. But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured he seemed hardly human, and from his appearance one would scarcely know he was a man. And he will startle many nations. Kings will stand speechless in his presence. For they will see what they had not been told. They will understand what they had not heard about. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. we stand to worship.
Oh
You're the perfect Son of God in all His ways. You're walking in the dark with you and me. He knows what living is. He's acquainted with our grief. Man of sorrow, son of sorrow. can be. There's a God who weeps. There's a God who pleads. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of Son. Jesus, glory to God. 
how can there's a God who weeps there's a God who bleeds oh praise the one who would reach for me hallelujah
A reading from Matthew 27. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with white wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Many women were there, watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and placed it in his own new tomb that he had carved from the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. On Good Friday, we remember that we have a God who loves us. This is what Good Friday is all about. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. This is love. Greater love has no one than this, that they lay down their life for their friends. But what exactly is this love? What is the character of the love that we see on this Good Friday? It is a love which and both comforts and confronts. And first of all, it is a love that comforts. And of course, we all need comfort right now. We need comfort, the world needs comfort. And this, the cross, reveals a love that comforts us. When I think about the things that I'm most frightened of in life, they all seem to be present in the story of Good Friday. So darkness, I'm still a bit afraid of the dark. Or failure, humiliation, mockery, fear of pain, fear of rejection, ultimately the fear of abandonment. And what we see on Good Friday is Jesus going with us, being with us in all the things we're most afraid of. When we think about all the things we might be most afraid of for all our future, the next few months, weeks, years, Jesus is already there, and he is with us. But it's more than just Jesus being with us. It's something a bit more than that. A few years ago, when my, one of my, our children was very young, they woke up as scared of the dark. And I held my child in my arms, and I just said to them, Daddy, it's okay, Daddy's here. 
Daddy's here. Daddy's here. And my little child, must have been about four years old, just looked up at me and said, yes, I know that, but it's still dark. So that doesn't help. <laughs> and that's the thing, it's in the most difficult times, you can have someone who's with you and you think, actually, that actually doesn't make things any better. In fact, with some people, it might make it even worse. <laughs> the crucial thing is who is with you in that moment? And the one who is with us in the darkness, in the pain, in the rejection, in the humiliation, in abandonment, is Jesus Christ. And he is the light of the world who is in our darkness. He is the one who has overcome the world in our failure. He is the prince of peace in the midst of hostility, violence, and warfare. He is love itself in the middle of rejection and hurt and abandonment. And this is who is with us. And so the comfort is not only that there is someone with us, it's God who is with us and that he has done something about the problems. He has provided the solution. Psalm 23, that famous psalm where David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear for you are with me. But then it goes on, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And the staff in particular, I'm interested by. And because of the wooden staff, and wood is really important in the Old Testament. Because of course it was under a tree that Adam and Eve said no to God and brought in evil into the world. It was the wooden um, ark that Noah built to bring about this, the rescuing of his family from destruction. It was a wooden staff that Moses lifted up over the Red Sea and divided the Red Sea in order to bring freedom for the Israelites. It was a wood, a piece of wood that Moses threw into the bitter water to turn it sweet. And here on the cross, Jesus on a wooden cross turns bitterness into sweetness. He divides the curtain which represented our our distance, our separation from God. And he brought about the salvation, the rescuing of us all from slavery. And he reversed the no of humanity to God into an eternal yes to his Father. This is what our comfort is. When I think about what's going on around the world, particularly over the last two years of so many crises and so many uh, revelations, issues, sicknesses. It can be overwhelming, the, the pain out there and the pain within, the problems out there and the problems within, the darkness out there and the darkness within. My only real comfort has been the cross because no one person can carry, can bear all the pain that we see around us. But there is one whose heart is infinite. And on the cross, he carried all our sin. He bore our pain, he bore our sin. The problems within, the problems around. He is our comfort. And so this is a love that comforts, but it's also a love that confronts. Because this love actually exposes all the failures of the world. It expo exposes the failures of politics. I love the moment where the centurion says, surely this was the son of God. Because the centurion was in the service of Tiberius Caesar, the emperor. Tiberius Caesar, son of God. But when he saw how Jesus died, suddenly all the pretensions of Rome fell away. And he decided, actually, no, this is true leadership. The temptations, I imagine, for all leaders, political or otherwise, is to try to persuade other people to make sacrifices that you yourself are not willing to make. But on the cross, we see one who was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice that no one else was able to make for our sake. And so it exposes politics. It also exposes the failure of crowds because the crowd were given a very simple and easy choice between Barabbas and Jesus Christ, between the only perfect human being who has ever lived and a criminal, between good and evil. And they very quickly, unanimously, and easily 
chose evil over good. He exposes the, the failures of the church because Jesus' followers, when Jesus is arrested and chose self-preservation and compromise over faithfulness to their own Messiah. And it exposes actually each and every human heart because you know the seriousness of the problem by the nature of the solution. So when one of our children was born, my wife Tara, just after giving birth, she looked a bit, she said she didn't feel very well, which was understandable because she'd just given birth. And she said she felt a bit faint. And the midwife looked at her, then turned to me and said, hit the button. And I looked at the wall next to me and there were all kinds of buttons and wires. And she said again, hit the button. And I still, I just froze, wasn't sure what was going on. She pushed me out of the way, whacked this red button, and then six or seven people came into the room to help Tara, who um, had lost too much blood. And that moment, I realized this was a serious issue. Just recently, two weeks ago, something very similar happened, which was I cut my foot really badly. <laughs> and I, like, it was really bad, and I... Again, I liked her. I felt a bit faint, and I was, I, I thought I've just, when I say my foot, I mean, I mean my toe, but it was, it was my little toe, but I think I'd, I think perhaps it hit an artery. There, an artery. there might be an artery in my little toe. Anyway, so things were really quite serious. I managed to get to the kitchen, and I said to, T where Tara was making lunch, I said, Tara, I need your help. And... I wasn't sure whether she was going to focus on uh, calling an ambulance first or just trying to stem the bleeding. But what she did was she, she looked at my foot and my toe and said to me, it's barely bleeding. I'm making lunch. Sort it out yourself. You can have one of the children's plasters if you're desperate. <laughs> and at that moment, I thought, maybe this isn't quite as serious as the issue when Tara had just given birth to one of our children. But you know the nature of how serious the problem is by what the solution has to be. And the fact that the solution had to be Jesus dying on a cross is something that shatters our pride and removes all self-confidence. I mean, Jesus could heal incurable diseases with a simple prayer. He could cast out demons with a word. He can even raise people from the dead with a touch of his hand or by slightly raising his voice. But in order to deal with our bitterness and selfishness, with our prejudice, our passivity in the face of injustice, my failures as a father, my failures as a husband, in order to deal with those things, he had to die on the cross. He, God created the world through seven phrases over just a few days. But to save our souls took him dying on a cross. And this is something that confronts each one of us with the depth and seriousness of what we need to be saved from. And so this love both comforts and confronts. But it does these two things together. Because it is easy to confront without comfort and saying, this is your problem, you're on your own, sort it out. Or to comfort, but to do so in a way that minimizes the issues and hides the problems. But this is a love that confronts as it comforts and comforts as it confronts. This is the love of God for us displayed on the cross. I love that the part of the story that talks about Joseph of Arimathea. This moment at the end when Joseph asks for the dead body of Jesus Christ. Because I think it raises a question for each of us about what kind, what kind of saviour, what kind of Jesus are we really interested in? Do we just want the miracle working Jesus or do we want the crucified Jesus? And the disciples, they were, they were happy with the, crucified, with the, with the 
the miracle working Jesus, but when it came to the crucified Jesus, they ran away. And for each of us, we're faced with this, with this question. I mean, do we want only, which is understandable, the sickness healing, debate winning, storm calming, water walking, bread multiplying, wine making, party going, great with children, Jesus? Or do we want the beaten and bloodied, hated and humiliated, lifeless and ultimately dead, Jesus. And this is the extraordinary thing about Joseph of Arimathea, that he asked for the body of Jesus. When at that moment, to him, he must think, this, this man can do nothing for me. And yet he loves him anyway. Actually, the phrasing is quite interesting. It says that he took the body, he wrapped it in cloths and laid it in a tomb which is the same language as at the beginning of Jesus' life, when his mother took him and wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger. And it points to this reality, which is that the beginning of life and the end of life is where we have to love people when they give us nothing back in return. And Joseph of Arimathea did it exactly that. He loved Jesus when it seemed like he could give nothing back to him. And yet, the extraordinary thing is, actually at that moment, when it looked like Jesus could do least for him, actually at that moment, Jesus was doing more for Joseph of Arimathea than he could never know. He was descending into hell, he was defeating the devil, he was ending death, he was ending sin, he was bringing about the salvation of the world. And that actually is the greatest comfort and one of the things I've been holding on to this Easter time, which is that there are times when it seems very obvious what Jesus is doing for all of us. He's answering prayers and it feels like he's near and he's guiding us and he's helping us. But then there are other times when it feels like he's distant, when he's not answering our prayers, when he's not helping us, he's not there for us. And that is the moment to continue to choose to love him, but also to hold on to what we see on Good Friday, which is where Jesus seemed to be doing least, actually he was achieving most. And that is always true. When Jesus appears to be doing least, actually he's doing the most. That is the comfort of God's love displayed on the cross on Good Friday. Shall we pray? And why don't actually let's stand as, as we pray. I'm gonna just give all of us an opportunity to receive that love again. The cross is the demonstration of the love of God for each one of us. But then the Bible says that the love of God is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And so on the cross, it's, I mean, John's gospel says that blood and water flowed from the side of Jesus. Blood representing forgiveness. All sins cancelled. And water, the water of the Holy Spirit of new life. So let's receive for ourselves what Jesus has done for us. His forgiveness, his freedom. And so we pray, come Holy Spirit. Pour your love into our hearts. I want to give uh, actually all of us an opportunity to again put our faith in Jesus Christ.
that moment when Joseph of Arimathea was just unashamed to go to the person who'd put Jesus to death and say, I want Jesus. And let's uh, make a decision for ourselves. You may have never done this, actually. You may have never made that decision of, I, I want Jesus, Lord. I want you in my heart. I want you in my life. I want what you've done for me on the cross for me. And if you want to pray that prayer, this is something maybe we could all do. Where we say again, thank you and sorry and please. <coughs> so just let's all just echo this prayer in our hearts. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you for your promise of your offer of complete forgiveness. And Lord, I am sorry for all that I've done that is wrong, the ways that I've hurt other people, the ways I've hurt you, the things I've done, the things I have neglected to do. And I receive your forgiveness made possible through the cross. And now please live in my heart through the Holy Spirit. That I might begin to love others in the same way, following you and taking up my cross, being willing to do anything and everything for the one who loves me. If anyone prayed that prayer for the first time, I want to recommend two things. First of all, please come and introduce yourself to me after the service. But all secondly, please do Alpha. And actually, if anyone has not yet done Alpha, Alpha is an opportunity to explore the, the meaning of life and questions of faith. And it starts again, beginning of May, and it's just a wonderful weekly opportunity to explore these deep and essential questions. And it's transformative for so, so many people. So I'd recommend that wholeheartedly. So find out more information about that at the end. But we're going to uh, continue in our service. We're going to worship. So let's uh, remain standing and do that.
Never know. 